This is Untapped with M.E. and I am M.E. On this podcast, I love to do my two favorite things and that is tell true and crazy stories about my life in this small town of Nacogdoches, Texas and drink beer. Lovely, delicious beer. We're going to drink some right now. I am drinking Tangerine Triple Star right here. Let's give it a try. This is a triple AZ IPA. Triple. So you would think it would taste strong and no good, but uh uh-uh, it tastes so smooth, but it is strong. It is ABV 9.2, so drink if you are an adult. The can says that it is packed with fresh tangerine, and that's good. I needed some fruit today. So, (laughs) all right. I got this at the Craft Beer Cellar, by the way, in Dallas, where you can Drink beer while you buy beer. Life just gets so good. Okay, get to some. Let's begin our story. Woohoo! It is Blood in the Pines, part of our series called Murder and Crime in Nacogdoches, Texas. This is the story of Christian Philip James Oliver. Y'all, this story resulted in a book, a documentary, and media attention around the world. It is a story of a crazy combination of art, murder, and God. (laughs) Yeah, and it all takes place in my hometown, Nacogdoches, Texas. Nacogdoches is way deep in the piney woods of East Texas. We call it living behind the pine curtain. We call it that because being surrounded by this thick wall of pine trees makes us feel a little like we're living in our own world. And sometimes we have our own rules in our little world here. All along the highways in our county, those pine trees press in on you. Their needles poke. Their pine cones prick. Sometimes bad things happen beneath the dark of their shade. I'm going to tell you about one of those bad things. It's some really terrible, crazy poo-poo. It happens in 1998 out on Camp Tonkawa Road. In 1998, I am 35 years old, y'all. This is me in 1998 with my daddy and my sister Rosemary. We are celebrating daddy's 70th birthday. He is Judge Jack Pierce of the 145th District Court of Nacogdoches, Texas. He will be the judge for the trial of the people who do the bad thing on Camp Tonkawa Road. Camp Tonkawa was a rite of passage for us kids. It is a magical shamrock green spring. In the summer, we would drive down Camp Tonkawa Road and we would sneak into that spring. Ooh, it was cold, but we'd swing into it off a rope anyway. No one knew then that one day something horrific was going to happen down that road. Now this next part we're gonna call Two Fathers. It is March 17th, 1998. It is just after 6.30 p.m. on an ordinary Tuesday. Joe Collins is watching Lonesome Dove. It's his favorite movie. It is a Father's Day present from his son. He raised four boys and a girl. He is 64 now. He is a veteran. He is a grandfather. He is the sort of man who takes care of his own. Joe Collins lives on Camp Tonkawa Road. He gets in his little red truck to go get some supper. There is a cafe just up the road. He will get his dinner to go and come back and watch the rest of the movie. He turns out the lights, but leaves the TV on. After all, he'll just be right back. The country kitchen is just a few minutes away. He drinks a cup of coffee while he waits for his to-go box. He gets a burger and fries. He heads home. He will be eating alone. Joe has been divorced eight years now. She remarried. He never does. What Joe does have is his little house surrounded by the deep piney woods. He can do here what he loves best, hunting and fishing. 
There is hardly anybody out here on Camp Tonkawa Road to bother him. But today there will be, and that to-go meal, y'all, is never going to be eaten. The next morning, around 10 a.m., a neighbor is driving by Joe's house, and he sees that the door is open and the porch light is still on. He stops to investigate. There at the foot of the front porch lies a body. It is face up, yet he can hardly tell who it is. He has been shot in the face. He has been beaten in the face. But oh, those blue eyes staring straight up to the sky give it away. It is Joe Collins, y'all. Three hours away in Waco, Texas, a United States postal worker is recovering from a long night at work. He has been mindlessly processing the mail on a graveyard shift. He is immaculate, short hair, thin mustache. See this long, thick brick wall? He lives behind there. Somewhere behind that wall, there is a large two-story house. It has six bedrooms and three bathrooms. His wife inherited the house from her grandfather. He was one of the first black physicians in Waco. Now that lot includes the house, his office, and another building. It takes up a city block. Inside the house, the owners live gently and beautifully. The home is filled with art and books and musical instruments. See these rundown buildings right next door? See the graffiti across the street? This is a bad part of Waco, y'all. The house is hard to find. Well, that is just the way the man who lives there likes it. He doesn't care to be known. But in spite of this, oh, he is. His name is Kermit Oliver. He is one of the most important living black painters in America. Among many awards, he is the only artist in America commissioned to design for the great house of Hermes and Thrones. He produces exquisite art for their high-end scarves worn around the necks of celebrities and royalty. The work of Kermit Oliver is a psychedelic trip, baby, of pulled color and crazy combinations. A baby and a snake, a cow and a cat, the past and the present, mythology and wildlife. Everything connects in the world of Kermit Oliver. So Kermit Oliver isn't working that tedious night job because it's the only work he can get. <laughs> Hardly. Just one Kermit Oliver painting might fetch $70,000, y'all. That is some crazy poo-poo good. He chose that job years ago for the benefits and he chose the graveyard shift so that he could spend as much time as possible with the people he loves most, his three little children. They are often in Kermit's paintings. For example, look at this Kermit Oliver painting, The Resurrection. It is nine feet tall and six feet wide. It's big, y'all. This Christ is almost as white as the burial sheets that float around him. He stands in stark contrast to the violent chaos of the orange and black behind him. This Christ is naked, mm -hmm, except for a glorious crown of Easter lilies. The face of this Christ is unusual, y'all. This is not a Middle Eastern man with long flowing brown hair and a thick beard. This is the white face of a modern man. It is the face of someone Kermit knows and loves. It is his son, Christian. He is the man who murders Joe Collins. This next part we will call a son. Kermit Oliver's paintings are permeated with the faces of the people in his life. You will see black children and black babies. You will see black people with weathered faces. But his own son is not black. He is a black man with white skin. If you were thinking his mother is white, well, you were wrong. Katie Oliver is black. The boy's skin color is no mystery to his parents. 
Kermit Oliver describes his heritage as a Heinz 57 mix. <laughs> Yet, here's a photo of a little black boy in a Boy Scout uniform. It is Christian. He seems to get lighter as he gets older. Well, no big deal, except that it is a big deal. A teen needs to feel he belongs. He needs a strong identity. The black kids may not have embraced Christian. The white kids may not have embraced him either. His mother described the situation this way. Christian had a very bright appearance and some people who had been kind to him as long as they thought he was white have turned away from him when they discovered he was from an African-American family. Hmm. But you know who does accept Christian Oliver? The kids driving around smoking pot. The kids looking for trouble. This is what brings Christian to Nacogdoches. He has come to hang out with two teenage boys. Christian Oliver is 20 years old in 1998. He is very young, but he's not a teenager. He has taken some college courses. He has served in the Navy, albeit it was only 39 days, and he has had a full-time job. What is he doing hanging around these two local kids? Lonnie Rubacaba is 16 years old, y'all. His brother Bernardo Rubacaba is only 15. They call him Benny. Lonnie and Benny are brothers. They are about to make the biggest mistake of their lives, y'all. By that night, Benny and Lonnie are in some real crazy poo-poo. They are at Nacogdoches Medical Center. Lonnie's leg is just about blown away. The ER staff are asking a lot of questions. The brothers say they were out in the country at a place the kids call the farm. It's where teens go to drink. They say that someone drives by and shoots at them. Well, nobody gonna believe that crazy poo-poo story. Their mama knows that nobody gonna believe that crazy poo-poo story. Mama gets Benny to tell her the truth. Mama convinces those boys to tell investigators the truth. It's their best chance for the best outcome. Detectives interview them separately. There is no opportunity for them to sync their stories. The stories match up. So now, police are looking for one man. Christian Philip James Oliver. When police look up his record, what they find is nothing. It's clean, y'all. There is no indication of criminal activity in his whole life. Well, you're gonna find out the truth of that in a little bit. Nacogdoches investigators head to Waco at 11 p.m. They pull up to that house in the dark behind the wall. Katie Oliver meets them at the gate. You know she was starting to worry for the worst. Christian lives in a building on the property. It was his great-grandfather's doctor's office. He isn't there, but something of interest is. It is a pair of bloody jeans. Christopher knows where Christian is. Christopher is Christian's older brother. He tells police that Christian called to say he is in Houston. Investigators check the caller ID in the home and bingo! Christian has driven from Nacogdoches to Waco to Houston in quick succession. He is hiding now at the Tides 2 Motel. Officers find him there. They arrest him. He is not alone. Mm -mm. See, he does not come to Nacogdoches that day by himself. Someone comes with him, y'all. That person is a woman. She is five years older than him. She is white. She is cotton white with lemon hair. Her name is Sonia Fawn Reed. She is Christian's girlfriend, y'all. Now this next part, we're gonna call the judge. Kermit Oliver hires one of the best defense attorneys in the state of Texas. His name is Mike DeGuerin. He has those stocky, boot-wearing, grinning good looks. He and his famous brother, Dick DeGuerin, were trained by a Texas legal legend, Percy Foreman. Foreman was counsel for the defense and 1,500 death penalty cases 
only one was executed. Mike DeGuerin thinks his training makes him good enough to charge his clients nearly half a million dollars. Katie and Kermit Oliver will get the money. And so the great Mike DeGuerin comes from Houston to the piney woods of East Texas. He will face our own local legend, Judge Jack Pierce. Judge Pierce is old school Nacogdoches, y'all. He was born only two blocks from the courthouse. He's been doing this job for 36 years. This court is his ship. You better believe he is the captain. Judge Pierce requires formality even for jury selection in this trial. Men reporting for jury selection will wear coats and ties. If they forget, well, they can go home and get them. Ladies best not show up in pants. One woman recalls not fondly. I went before him once and he made me go home and change into a dress. Dumbest thing ever. <laughs> Understood, ma'am. Judge Pierce thinks serving on this jury is a real opportunity. The 200 people who are personally interviewed in court over six weeks do not want this real opportunity. They are likely to wind up deciding if someone lives or dies. They've seen the news. A whole lot want to be excused. Well, Judge Pierce is not in an excusing mood. 12 people are going to experience the real opportunity of this trial. Judge Pierce is going to keep this trial on a tight schedule. Now, DeGarren is still running on a Houston courtroom time. This is Judge Jack Pierce courtroom time. DeGarren, are we going to be working five days a week, Your Honor? Judge Pierce, you can't try a lawsuit and let the attorney be here, yonder, and there. There has to be some continuity. And to think about piecemealing this out. You know, the courts never worked part-time. DeGarren, can we move that business to Monday, Your Honor? Judge Pierce, we're not doing it Monday morning, sir. You can have your choice, Sunday afternoon or Friday night after a meal. <laughs> well, not everybody likes Judge Jack Pierce. <laughs> Fair enough. But you know, I love him. He's my daddy, y'all, so I got to drink to my daddy. Hang on. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Someone from out of town, after this murder trial was over, observed this about Judge Pierce. You have been put in a position to have great power over the lives of others. It must not have been easy over the years to silently shoulder blame for things that disgruntled litigants attributed to you. You stand erect and proud because of your integrity. I hope your children realize that the path you have chosen is not an easy one. You know who wrote that, y'all? Mike DeGuerin, he did, ha <laughs> ha. Next time the murder trial begins, we will hear all the ugly details of blood in the pines. So subscribe and follow and tap in to Untapped with M.E.